So Talia, just to recap today, we're going to record the podcast. And once it's complete, I'm going to um, bundle everything up. I'll make sure and post on social media, on my website, and I'll be sure to uh, pass on to you the, um, the file so you have it for your own purpose as well, if that's okay with you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. Got cancer? Who do you tell? How do you do it? And on top of that, what if you're dealing with health inequities? You or a loved one gets a diagnosis of cancer. You're shocked, you're scared, and maybe you're angry. And then you think of your loved ones. On top of that, you're thrown in the maze of a healthcare system, navigating prior auths, scheduling appointments, dealing with the bills. Are they accurate? And how do you pay for this care? And then you wonder, are you getting the same care as everyone else? The care you deserve. To get into this topic today, I'm delighted to have Talaya Dendi on the show. Talaya is a 12-year cancer thriver, cancer doula, independent patient advocate, cancer health equity consultant, mental health first aider, and podcaster who has dedicated her career to guiding, supporting, and advocating for people diagnosed with cancer. She developed a fulfilling career path from cancer patient to founder and CEO of On the Other Side, a cancer navigation enterprise using a holistic approach to deliver personalized and valuable emotional support. Get on the other side of cancer and get your life back. Talia also hosts the Navigating Cancer Together podcast and is a contributing author to a number one bestselling book, I Survived Cancer and Here's How I Did It. It shares the stories of cancer survivors and thrivers to spread hope and show that a cancer diagnosis is not the end. Welcome to the show, Talia. Thank you so much, Sandy, for having me. It's a pleasure to talk with you today. And you as well. And what an amazing bio. I just can't thank you enough for all the amazing stuff that you are doing, um, helping people and just spreading your word words of wisdom. So really appreciate that. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Well, I was hoping we could start out today. I always love to hear people's story of kind of telling your story and how it got you into doing all the amazing things that you're doing today. Sure, I'm happy to share. So it's a story that unfortunately, a lot of people probably have had a similar experience. And I like to start off by saying that I was diagnosed with cancer in my early 30s out of the blue. And I say out of the blue because I was never really sick prior to getting a cancer diagnosis. The worst, you know, I ever was sick was with the flu. So uh, 2010, a year before my diagnosis, I went to see my primary health care physician. And after my physical, I pointed out a lump on the side of my neck that um, wasn't very big, but it was there for about a week. It had not gone away. And at the time I was working out vigorously, like several, almost every day of the week. And she didn't look at it or anything. She didn't ask any questions. She just kind of blew it off and said, well, it's probably because, you know, from working out a pulled muscle or something, I wouldn't worry about it. Well, Sandy, a year later, the lump was there and it was hard and it was bigger. So I shared that information with my mom that I was very concerned about this lump. Uh, she, you know, advised me to go to a different doctor. And it was her physician who happened to be a lady from the Somali community. I went to this doctor and after the physical, again, shared my concerns. Her response was totally different. She looked at it. She touched it. She asked questions. While she was touching it, I could see the change in her appearance, her facial appearance. And it was a look of concern. It was a look of something's not right, <laughs> which I already knew, Sandy, but I never expected it to be cancer. So she instructed me to go have an ultrasound right away. That ultrasound went into a small needle aspiration. That turned into a biopsy of that lymph node. And then finally a diagnosis. I had to go through those several steps because the results kept coming back inconclusive. Now with the fine needle aspiration, they had not gotten a big enough sample size or tissue size to really determine for sure that it was cancer. So ultimately I got a call on a Friday evening on my way home from work um, from a nurse 
And she shared with me that I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, before going further, Sandy, I would like to discuss the issue of waiting a year before seeing another doctor. Now, that's where Talia the Advocate started once I got that diagnosis. And many of the listeners may be wondering, well, why did she wait so long? Part of it, Sandy, was because, you know, I was so focused on climbing the corporate ladder. I was, you know, focused on helping some of my family members with their with their challenges and concerns that they were going through. Life was busy. However, Sandy, that is not an excuse. I will tell anybody today, if you are not getting answers that you need, that you want, if you are not being viewed as a very important patient from your doctor, if you're being blown off, go see someone else and keep seeing different doctors until you get the answers that you need and that you're satisfied with. So now when I look back, I realized that wasn't the best um, decision to wait. But of course, fear, a busy life. And then also, Sandy, I can honestly say this today, even a little bit of self-worth played a part in that. And your doctor's not always right. And so in a nutshell, Sandy, that is my experience. I was, um, I had six months of chemotherapy and a month of radiation. And I'm happy to say that today I'm doing well. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. And I so appreciate your honesty about that because, you know, we, we go and see a physician and they're human too, at the end of the day. And I often mention that they are so there's physician burnout today. They're shorted or providers. So when I say provider it could be physician or mid-level, but providers today, there's shortages, there's burnout, they're working long hours. And I often remind people that with their health insurance contracts, they're paid on quantity and not quality. Doesn't make them bad people. That's not what I'm saying, but it, it does open it up for, for error or I'm just tired. I am sure it's nothing, but I love what you said about being your own advocate and saying, you know, maybe this isn't right for me. I'm not getting a good feeling about it. You know, I kind of liken it to dating. I mean, if you go out on a date and you it just doesn't work with someone, you go into the next person. Why can that not also be applied to a that provider relationship? I felt like the visit was rushed. I didn't get my questions answered. I'm going to go find somebody else and 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 not wait. So I so appreciated. Uh, that you said that, and just the importance of doing that is just, is just, just, it can't be talked about enough. Thank you, Sandy. And I also bring it up because as women, you know, we have families, we have children, we're trying to juggle the corporate life and all these other responsibilities. And we typically put ourselves last. That's not an excuse. You have to put yourself first so you can continue to care for your family and, you know, go after your dreams and your goals and whatever else it is that is important to you. Absolutely. Now you, you talked about, and I'm so glad that you're doing well today. That's such a, a wonderful blessing. And now as we talk about you, obviously going through this, had to navigate the system, dealing with, with cancer diagnosis. Can you kind of talk about how you did that and kind of what you experienced? Yes, Sandy. So um, I chuckle because I, I always say that's when Talia the Advocate was born. I'm introverted by nature, very laid back, but that changed when I really saw that my life was really on the line. And it was, in a sense, my responsibility to make sure that I got what I needed. And if I didn't know what that was, I needed to learn as much as I could so I could figure that out. So thankfully, I was blessed with a really great oncologist. And however, there were still gaps in my care, and we'll get to that in a bit, but blessed with a great oncologist. And what I had done during our first meeting was I set the stage. I basically, in you know, uncertain terms, basically said I'm the customer. We're in a partnership here. I will not be told what to do. I would like for you to explain to me what my options are, what that looks like, and then also potential side effects. And not only that, how many people have actually survived based on the treatments that you're recommending? So really getting that detailed information. Now, Sandy, that's not for everyone. I understand that. 
but that's the approach that I took because that's what worked best for me. I also came prepared and I noticed that the first few um, doctor's appointments that I had, every time I came prepared, it seemed like their level of respect rose because they would always point out, boy, you are one of the few patients who comes with your questions, your notebook. At the time, they were providing uh, these notebooks for cancer patients to take down notes and things like that. And every time I was ready, you know, um, and I had my notebook, I had my questions. And I asked my oncologist, I said, please talk to me as if we're business partners. This is a partnership. I don't want to be told what's going to be done to me. Just explain to me what my options are. We can talk through that, but ultimately it's going to be my decision. Now, Sandy, another thing I want to note about that is that's what I enjoy. I enjoy learning. I enjoy researching and things like that. So that's what made it easy for me. And I, again, I understand everyone's different, but I invested in a medical dictionary so that I could understand the reports and my lab results and all of those things and break those um, terms down. That helped me to be able to ask questions as well. And the other thing that I did was I just really started learning more about cancer and learning more about my body and um, really getting a handle on mind-body connection. I had never really studied that. I didn't know much about it. It wasn't this big thing back in 2011. And so the first thing, Sandy, is to form a relationship with your healthcare team set the tone, share what your expectations are with them. And then also, if you feel like you are not getting, again, your questions answered, or you, you ask something or you push back and your physician seems to get offended, it might be time to seek out a second opinion. You have that right. There's nothing wrong with that. So throughout that process, I learned I formed a partnership. I was very honest about my expectations. And then I was also honest about what I wanted my quality of life to look like. And that helped to lead the decisions that I made about treatment. Wow, that, that, those are some great some great tips there. And I, it, what, the last thing you said too, I say, and as I think that it's so important to kind of take a step back and look at, you know, this is your journey, your health journey. And where, what do you want that to look like? And then um, having working with physicians all day long, I'm sure that they loved how organized you were because often they 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 often talk about, you know, patients either come in or they don't ask questions and they so appreciate um, most really appreciate, you know, being organized and being able to to ask those questions because many do want to help. And so I just you were just a great advocate where that's concerned and some great tips to I would add to that is to not be afraid to ask questions, or um, I feel sometimes I've been there as a patient. If I've asked a question and I've gotten an answer and I still don't understand, I think we're reluctant to say, you know, this kind of what you did, we're, we're partners here, you know, talk to help me understand what my options are or to ask questions. And you have every right to do that. So I, uh, I often remind people to either maybe bring someone with them if they yes. feel nervous and or in many states, you can record the visit as well, and then maybe replay that later, and it maybe with the help of a loved one or whatever to to kind of really think through that. It's always an option as well. But I love how how you handle that. Thank you. And you know, Sandy, to to add to what you just said, you can even practice before you go. You know, maybe practice a couple of days before with someone that you trust. And then that person who is listening, they might say, hey, you forgot about this. You know, maybe you should add this in there. And because sometimes other people that, you know, know you well enough can see your blind spots. Yeah, that's a really good point. Now, as you were navigating through that, so now you, you have your notes out and you're you're going through the, uh, you've got your team, you're communicating with your team. Um we all know there's there's some speed bumps in that process. So can you talk a little bit about kind of what you experienced kind of navigating that system or any inequities that you may have encountered? Yes, Sandy. Um, navigating the healthcare system was tough. And um, even for someone like me who's, you know, um, organized and analytical, it's still tough. Um, one thing that I noticed, Sandy, was that 
it wasn't always clear what doctor you needed to see for what, especially once I got further um, into treatment and then even into survivorship. It's like, well, who should I be seeing now? I'm, I, I'm done with treatment. I'm not going to see my oncologist for three months. So who do I need to see now? And so really just figuring out who were the, the team players, who, you know, who do I need to talk to to get support from about mental health if I'm really struggling or I'm stressed out? Who do I need to talk to if I have financial concerns? So really understanding the structure, the organization of the hospital where I was receiving care was critical. And one of the things that I had done was I went to that hospital's website to kind of get an idea of who were these departments within this whole structure? And then I even asked too, um, you know, who can I talk to about this? Who can I talk to about that? So that was one thing that was very helpful. Um, the other thing, Sandy, is that at that time that I didn't have a patient navigator. I don't, you know, I know they're more popular now, but back then I didn't have one. So it was like, it was really between me my oncologist and his nurse. So the three of us worked really um, closely together to make sure that I got the things that I needed or, or I was directed in the right place for things that they didn't take care of. And so just, um, again, understanding where to go. And if you don't know where to go for, for whatever it is that you need, X and keep asking until you get that. The other thing um, you mentioned, uh, any health inequities. Um, one thing that I did notice, Sandy, was that um, my age, every time, <laughs> every time I went into the infusion, I was the only person, the youngest person and the only black person or person of color. And so my treatment, I feel like in that case, was not um, impacted because of my race. I'll say that. But honestly, looking back, I think that when I went to that primary care doctor, it might have been an issue. It not an issue, but it might have been a, a factor. Um, now, one thing that I did notice is that in the hospitals and clinics where I was getting treated, there were no black people or other people of color on those brochures. There were not. But had I not felt um, respected by my immediate healthcare team, I think it would have been worse. It would have been not so good. But because we had that relationship, because I was given the utmost respect from day one, um, that was not something that I experienced there. Now, in my work, I have learned a lot about the inequities that people experience. Um, and of course, that is tied to a lot of different factors. Of course, it's race, um, your social and economic status. You know, there's even people that if they're like single and they have children, it's like, well, you know, you need to go find health care or something like that. So um, in my work, I've seen it. And I've experienced in, it in other settings, but I can honestly say that when it came to my cancer care, it was like God just blessed me tremendously to not have to experience it in that setting. Well, I'm so glad that you didn't have to experience that, but but I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that um, today, but it's a sad that we have to talk about it, but I think it's important to be aware of that that, that could po possibly exist, especially if um, you're struggling with um, um, any, you know, you mentioned social determinants or how you live, or if some people may judge you. And again, if that is happening, I think bringing it to discussing that with that patient navigator, because they do exist today. And I would add that um, there's risk management teams, like in large facilities, and they discuss those things. If people are feeling a certain way or not getting the care that they deserve, I go back to that again. And that's such a key statement there, the care that you deserve. It doesn't matter what skin color, what age, it matters that you get that care you deserve. And if you're not getting that to navigate um, to the right person. So, uh, but I'm glad that your experience was a good one, but you talked about helping people today and what you're seeing today. I kind of wanted to you know, certainly hear more about your story at any time to intersperse that, but I know that this led you on this journey um, to all the stuff that you're doing today and being a cancer doula. So can you help listeners know what a cancer doula is? 
Yes, absolutely. If it's okay, Sandy, one thing I would like to add first is that there was one area and that was getting support with mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, There were no um, women social workers that I was referred to. There were none, no Black people or people of color, African-American. And not unfortunately, fortunately, but in a sense, unfortunately, I was blessed to be able to talk to someone. However, he was an older white man. And so because of the huge age difference and some other factors due to, you know, to race, um, I really didn't feel like he would be able to really grasp and understand and relate to the really deep things that I wanted to share. So I say that to say it's important to have different people, different backgrounds, different diversity in the healthcare setting, because everyone has different needs. Some people may be more comfortable talking to someone that looks like them. And in that case, um, it would have been helpful to have that. And I, and I didn't. So. No, I appreciate you. Yeah, please interject. And I, I, um, I appreciate you saying that because you're absolutely right. And especially with something as sensitive as mental health issues, which sometimes people are uncomfortable asking for help or especially who they share with. And you're so right. I can't, it, it's so important to, to have somebody to, to relate to or have those resources. And, and I hope that we're seeing more of that today, you know, with our mental health crisis and, and again, shortage of providers. Um, I think it's important to be aware of that and ask your options. And if not available, you know, maybe ask for that different referral because you matter at the end mm-hmm. of the day and getting that the most successful outcome for you and mental health is based on who is treating you. So thank you for mentioning that. Absolutely. And a lot of people, if you haven't been through it, everyone, a lot of people, I should say, thinks about cancer in a physical sense. But I always say that cancer impacts every area of your life. And it's not just a physical disease. It's also an uh, emotional and mental disease as well. There's times where you're very stressed out. You feel a heavy burden of uncertainty. You have high levels of anxiety. It's important to have someone that you can talk to and that can guide you through that. Oh, most definitely. Uh, Definitely. So, so does that kind of going back to uh, cancer doula? A cancer doula? What, <laughs> yeah. what is a cancer doula? And yes, Sandy, thank you. Um, so, a cancer doula. I, I like to explain it this way. A lot of people are familiar with birth doulas. That's the beginning of life, helping someone bring new life into the world. Uh, Deaf doulas are becoming more and more popular these days. They help people to transition to the end of their life. As a cancer doula, we focus on the present. And what we're focused on is how can we get you on the other side of cancer so that you can live the quality of life that you would like to live and that you deserve to live. And so that's what it that's what a cancer doula means to me. I am working with my clients to help them look at cancer in the face, say, hey, not only physically, How can I get over cancer and heal? But what other areas of my life do I need to look at so that, you know, when I heal, I'm healing emotionally, spiritually, mentally, in other areas. And so I essentially, Sandy, walk with people. I guide them. I provide them the information and resources that they need. It's a holistic and personalized approach to providing emotional support to people um, going through a very tough time. Oh my goodness. I, I love the name and I love that, that what you do, because sometimes I think is that I kind of mentioned in the beginning, there's that shocked and, and that anger, maybe and that fear, and you try to lean on a loved one or whatever, but they're kind of going through that too and saying, oh my goodness, my loved one has this. And so I love that they can go to somebody like you who has that personalized approach and who's been down that road because you don't have to be alone through this process. Yes, that's so true, Sandy. And then a lot of times what I see often, Sandy, is that when a person is experiencing cancer, they're holding back from sharing certain things with their loved ones because they don't want to make them any more stressed out and concerned and worried than they already are. Then also, Sandy, here's another thing that I I see consistently 
we start off talking about cancer, but so many other things are under the surface. It could be past trauma. It could be unhealthy relationships. It could be stressful jobs. It could be so many different things, Sandy. And all of those things are a part of healing. And not only that, those things, some of them, trauma, for example, could have helped contribute to the person getting sick in some way. So that's why we talk about mindset and mind-body connection. All of those things are part of healing, and it's a part of our well-being as well. So can I put you a little bit on the spot here? I hope this is okay. <laughs> but, um, can you obviously respecting someone's um, um, someone's privacy, but can you kind of share a, a, with us a story that you have had helping someone just to help people better understand that and kind of how you helped and kind of the outcome on the uh, on the other side? Absolutely. One story that I love to share. It was a lady in the UK. And I was supporting her on her cancer journey. Very lovely lady, very um, respectful and kind of timid in a sense. Um, But she kept having issues every time she went in for chemotherapy. She would get sick every time. They would literally have to stop it in the middle because she would start vomiting. And so she, she, I didn't know this for a a few weeks. And finally she opened up to me and she shared that. She's like, Talia, every time I go, I get sick. And she said, I'm, I'm kind of afraid to say something because I don't want them to think the oncology nurse to think that I'm not appreciative of her help that, you know, I'm trying to tell her she's not doing a good job, that sort of thing. So what her and I did, Sandy, is we put together a script, put together a script of how she could approach this um, concern and get the help that she need and talk with this uh, oncology nurse. And um, because she was very nervous and anxious about it, that's why we created the script. And we practiced that. And we practiced it until she was comfortable and not only that, it was in, done in a way that was her true voice. And so by her getting comfortable voicing her concerns to me, she was able to do that with the nurse and then throughout the rest of her treatment. And so the next time she went in, she talked with her oncology nurse. They gave her more anti-nausea medication so she would not get sick. And not only that, they apologized and said, oh, we had no idea that, you know, we weren't giving you enough. We wish you would have said something sooner. And so that helped to build their relationship and make both parties a little bit more comfortable. So that's an example. That's one. Another one is uh, there was a married couple. Initially, I started working with the person uh, who had cancer and she felt really unsupported by her, her husband and got more information about that. And I just kind of probed and asked certain questions. Well, this, of course, had been going on with other things prior to her being diagnosed with cancer. So with her permission, I spoke with her husband separately. And I was just kind of the mediator. I said, you know, this is a tough time for your wife. This is what she's going through. And this is how she feels. And this is what she needs from you. And so he had no idea that it was that she felt that way. And they were able to, he was able to, after sharing that with him, they were able to talk to each other, hash everything out. And he was able to show up in a way that was supportive for her. And then also he didn't feel closed out anymore because that's how he felt. And so this work is so important because it's not just about cancer. You know, it's impacting relationships, families, children, you name it. And so those are some very important examples. I think, you know, one of both are asking for what you need. That's the key in both of those. Communication is the key in both of those. And then also just feeling like you're safe. You can talk about these things and not holding else in, which can further cause stress, anxiety, and which can further impact your immune system in a negative way. So I feel like this is something that people need. Um, 
and there's no pressure. There's no judgment. You're free to share whatever you would like. Wow. Amazing stories. And so glad that they were able to find you. I'm just so taken back by um, it, it, you know, by your ability to help these, these individuals and, you know, thinking about that married couple for just one moment, I mean, it, it, you're so mired in, in, oh my gosh, this is what I'm going through. And it's easy to, for people to misinterpret, but to have that third party kind of come in there and either bring to light issues or just have creating that safe environment where they can talk and create such a positive outcome, I think is amazing. And that's what I really focus on. I love that can, the cancer doula because you just, you're focused on care, you're focused on scheduling that appointment. And I think somewhere along the way you get lost and what your mental health or what's going on, but just having someone that third party can come in and help navigate that and bring to light some things that um, can just help you be in a better place that you need to be to get healthy as as you were saying, saying at the end there. So that's, uh, I appreciate you sharing those stories. Sure. So I know you are on so many great things that you're doing. So, um, so if someone just talk to me about if someone is interested in knowing more about you, your, the, your being a cancer doula, getting your services, just tell us a little bit about where, how they find you. Absolutely, Sandy. Thank you for asking. They can actually find me at ontheotherside.life. Again, that's ontheotherside.life. That is my website. And you can go there and learn more about what a cancer doula is. You can learn more about my story. And then also you can see some of the services that I have available. Um, I do one-on-one via Zoom or over the phone. So it doesn't matter where you're located. I'm, I'm available to help you. And then also, I recently launched a new service, which is Cancer Doula Pen Pal Support. That is for people who may need support, Sandy, but they are, you know, they have financial constraints. They have time constraints. You know, they're just not comfortable talking on Zoom. There's so many different things, but it's based on affordability and convenience. And those are barriers to care that a lot of people have. And so I wanted to create something where if they have a question, if they have a concern or they want ongoing support, they can just send me an email and then we communicate via email. And then not only that, they'll have a record of everything that we discussed. They'll be able to see their progress if we work together long-term, but also they can do it from the comfort of their home and there's no pressure. You know, they don't have to, you know, come up with answers on the spot if I ask them a question. And then also, Sandy, it's a creative way to really think about what it is that you need, what it is that you're struggling with, what it is that you want. And um, also it can serve as a journal of your cancer journey as well. Well, I love that you've added that. That's really awesome. I often say, Mm -hmm oh, let me think about that or let me put it in writing because I think better when I write, I'm writing it down. And so, yes. because it, it is such a different process to the point if you're on Zoom or you're having to come up with that response and you're like, well, I haven't thought about that. It's a good question. And you feel this pressure to come up with a response. But the truth is, is if you think about it a bit and then you put it in writing, you're like, wow, I didn't know I was struggling with that. So love that you're doing that. That's great stuff. Now you also have a podcast, Navigating Cancer Together as well. Can you share with us a little bit about that? Sure. So Navigating Cancer Together is a show that is for people from different walks of life that have been impacted by cancer. And they could be, you know, cancer patients, cancer survivors, caregivers. But then also, Sandy, I think it's so important to make people aware of what's out there in terms of complementary care or alternative therapies. Um, Because a lot of times people, they may want to try something new or in addition to the care they're receiving, but they don't know where to start. They don't know if they're vetted. And so that's what this podcast is about, is people sharing their stories, but then also other professionals from the complementary and alternative care areas coming in to talk about how they support people with cancer. 
You know, I hear all the time people say this to me when I is in the, the number one statement is I didn't know that that exists or I didn't know about about how to do that. And so we don't deal with healthcare every day, but then when we, we when it and I wish everyone best of health, but when it does hit, I mean, now you're struggling with navigating the system, but it, it's so amazing that there's these resources out there where someone's been on that journey and they can help you. And so I'm so grateful that you have that and others are certainly willing willing to share. And we'll make sure a link to everything, um, to Leah, you mentioned so that uh, people can um, access these resources. Now, as we kind of wind down to our close, one of the things I like, because I could talk to you all day. I mean, I know there's <laughs> so much to share, but uh, but what I always like to do is just leave kind of some closing thoughts to you, uh, to the guest, and in this case, to you, of course, to share with us any final thoughts or words of wisdom that you'd like to share. Yes, there, there's so many. Um, in the light of health equity, if it's okay, I would like to share this information um, because I, I feel like it's so important. The CDC recently stated that Black people or African-American people have the highest mortality rate of any racial and ethnic group for all cancers combined and for most major cancers. So this is what health inequities look like. This is what not, this is what leading with biases look like. Is It results in people dying. This is what not recruiting more people of color into clinical trials looks like. They are missing out on opportunities to extend their lives. And this is so critical. Um, one thing quickly is clinical trials. I know that there, there's definitely a history of medical mistrust that has been done to the Black community. Um, they've been done wrongly. We've been done wrongly um, when it comes to health and health care. However, today, Black people and other people of color have the opportunity to take part in these clinical trials so that they can have data on how these drugs can you know, better their lives or extend their lives. Um, a lot of the data that they get from clinical trials is from white people. So that means more black people are dying because they're not being included in these trials. So that's another thing. Also back to the medical, um, you know, basically the, the medical <laughs> um, assassination that they have done to black people, there is only one way to move past that. That is to talk about it, to acknowledge it, and don't say they just don't care about their health. That is not true. A lot of people, minority people, people from diverse backgrounds, they don't feel like they're seen or that they're heard. And so that's where a lot of that comes from. So how do you build trust with someone that doesn't truly see you, that doesn't truly hear you voicing your concerns that blows you off when you say, hey, I have this pain in my side that has not gone away. Oh, don't worry about it. It's nothing. How can you gain someone's trust with that? And so that's one thing that I want to leave people with is that health inequities are killing people. They don't have to die, but they do have to be treated with respect they do have to be looked at as human beings, no matter how much money they have, where they work, whatever. So that's very important to share, I, I believe, when it comes to health inequities. The other thing is I like to encourage people, when you get a cancer diagnosis, I know it's easy to think about death because that's what we've been programmed to think about cancer is that, you know, you're going to die, you're going to be skinny and bald and walking down a hospital corridor, pushing an IV tube. Today, more people are surviving cancer than ever. That's why we have this issue now with how do we take care of people that have made it and survived cancer treatment. That's a whole nother topic, <laughs> but I just wanted to touch on that. So I like to encourage people to not think about dying, if you can, when you've received that diagnosis, think about what do I have to live for and use that as motivation to push through and get through what you're facing. And then finally, Sandy, I was not a 
very active or savvy healthcare consumer prior to being diagnosed. So I had a huge learning curve, but it was something that I had to take responsibility for. I felt like in order for me to live, that's how serious it was. And so I just wanna encourage the people out there listening, take responsibility for your health. If you are not getting what you need, if you are not being treated with respect, dignity, and like a human being, go somewhere else, get second opinions, you have that right. You are the consumer, you are the customer, and they need to meet your needs. Oh, well, that's all amazing. I don't want to stop now, but I really <laughs> appreciate you went back to the the inequities because what you said is so true and, and we need to just say it out loud. It is absolutely true. We have a healthcare caste system. And so in that, that exists today. And, and we got to just let that sink in because it's absolutely true. And in people of diverse backgrounds don't get the care that they need. And there's prejudice out the window. I'm obviously in, in healthcare and that's a problem, but um, if someone is, let's say, struggling back on that topic of, I want to be in a clinical trial, but I feel like I'm being discriminated against based on skin color. I mean, is there anything that that someone can do? Or do you I just, it just came to mind and I wanted to ask. Yes, I think one thing that they can do is talk to the, the person who's heading the clinical trial and say, hey, if they can figure out who that is. Sometimes, you know, these different clinical trial websites, they're hard to navigate, but I always encourage people to, you don't have to have gone through several treatments and say, oh, I need to do a clinical trial. Once you've received that diagnosis, you can ask, are there any clinical trials for this? And not just cancer, because that is another option. It doesn't mean that you seek out a clinical trial because that's the last resort. No, ask up front and get that information. If, if your doctor can't provide that, hey, who else can I talk to? And again, there's different websites online where you can go and research clinical trials. Um, again, that information is not um, they don't present it in a way that's very easy to understand. They're getting better, but I hear a lot of people still struggle with those online websites. Now, for example, Black women or Black men, well, Black women um, that are experiencing metastatic breast cancer, there's an organization called Touch, or they have a sister organization as well called When We Trial, and they can go to sites like that and get connected with other Black men and women who are interested in clinical trials, they explain how to go about doing that. They provide support and education as well. So that website is whenwetrial.org, I believe. And that's a resource for um, people of color that um, they can go there and get more, more information about clinical trials for metastatic breast cancer. Oh, that's awesome. So we'll include a link to that as well. And, uh, you know, kind of come in full circle. I think it comes back to the whole concept of, of being in the know and, and being your advocate. And the best way you can be your advocate is having that knowledge. So, 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 so grateful that the resources that you have on your website and that you are a resource as a cancer doula to help people. And I guess the one thing I'd say is you, you're not in this alone. I mean, there are people mm -hmm. that are out there. There's so many really resources and willing, willing to help. And it's important to, it's not the end, as you say, it, yeah. it's, but it's another chapter. That's true, but you don't have to navigate it alone. That's right, Sandy. You don't have to navigate it alone and you should not navigate it alone. We're not meant to go through life alone. So you're definitely not, you shouldn't go through cancer alone. It's, it's, there's someone out there, even if you feel like you can't go to your family or your friends, there's some, someone out there who can support you. There's so many free organizations as well. Um, Angel Foundation, Fourth Angel Mentor. Um, there's so many if finances are a barrier for you as well. Oh, it's amazing. You have been the light in my day. Uh, Thank just you. you tell, sharing your story. Um, I know my listeners are going to benefit greatly from it. So thank you for that. Again, we'll make sure all the uh, resources are linked um, or are, are available uh, to listeners. And I can't thank you enough for your time thank and you your so expertise. It's, it's so valuable. 
Thank you so much, Sandy. And I appreciate you having an interest in the work that I do and my cancer journey as well. And I just want to thank you for sharing your platform with me and allowing me to just talk about the work that I do. And I'm always happy to help people. So thank you. Mm -hmm. It's my pleasure.